Too Short, welcome back. What's up, man? Now, we've had a lot of interviews over the years, but I kind of want to focus on your story and mm-hmm. your history, because I think that's really important. You know, a lot of people are familiar with Too Short with various songs, right. but I don't think everyone knows the grind mm-hmm. and how much work it got, you know, you had to do just to get to the first album. Mm-hmm. So let's start in the beginning. You actually didn't grow up in the Bay. You grew up in South Central. Born and raised in L.A. Um, I moved when I was just turned 14. Okay. Going to high school. So from 14, you moved to Oakland. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, what was Oakland like at 14? When I got to Oakland, so when I, let me tell you a little bit about L.A. L.A. was uh, not, it was not the blue and red gang banging, you know, from Colors the Movie and all the other visuals you have from music videos and stuff of, of what L.A. gang banging is, the street life is like. It was prior to that. Prior to that, yes, you had Crips and Bloods and Pyrus and gangs and stuff, but it, it just wasn't like... Um, as much of just like, you know, just like every block, everywhere, everything. Just, it, it was, you know, you, you, had, you knew where to go and where not to go. So, very territorial city, very much a lot of um, places you can't go because you're from there and you can't go there. It just, you, you knew it at a young age. Like, if I'm riding my bike to my cousin's house, I had a route, and that route was gonna get me there safe. If you, if you hit the wrong block, you might have to come up off the bike or get into a fight or, I mean, something. So um, moving to Oakland, to me, when I first got there, it was like, it was like watching a movie because the only place I ever seen anything like that was a movie where you really see colorful pimping up close, where you really see um, on the news somebody just chopped up a body and dropped it off in the hills or, or somebody set off a car bomb. And I'm like, you know, I'm just like, where the fuck am I at? But at the same time, uh, I moved to Oakland the year after I heard hip hop for the first time. First time I ever heard hip hop was, uh, was Rapper's Delight and, you know, um, records like uh, King Tim the Third, just like, you know, just rapping on a record. It, was, it wasn't a lot. Yeah. And right when I moved to Oakland is when all the rap records started coming out. Like, it, they started coming out one after the other after the other, Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, and it was, you know, the sequence. It was just, just a lot of those early day groups from, from 1980, specifically 1980. Mm-hmm. And it just, um, you know, the year 1980, that's the year I started rapping. That's the year I moved to Oakland, went to Fremont High. That's the, that's the year, you know, I fell in love with hip hop. That was just, that, that was the start of Too Short. That was the birth of Too Short. I don't think I would have been a rapper if I stayed in LA. I, don't, I know I wouldn't have been a rapper named Too Short. I wouldn't have rapped about, you know, pimping and, and, and the game that I got from Oakland. So it was just, um, it was, to me, it was, I don't know. I, I, I gotta give you one other element too. My brother moved to Oakland a year before me and he was describing it to me. So I, I came there with expectations of this wonderful fun he was having, this place that he was loving, and it was all that. So, you know, that was, um, it was, it was, it, I look back on it like it was, it was like watching a movie. That's all I can say. Okay, so 1980, mm-hmm. were there any West Coast rappers at all? Um, I'm going to say that they definitely have rappers. What we were listening to, the, my first West Coast you know, rapper experience was probably like the Uncle Jam's Army stuff, the Egyptian okay, yeah, Lover from stuff. From L.A. The, you know, the, what was that? Um, L.A. Was that Dream. Team? L.A. Dream Team. That wasn't 80. That was 80s. That was early 80s. So yeah. it, it came along pretty early. Okay, I, so, Dr. Dre had records out in yeah. fucking 83. 80 yeah, it was shit. a world-class wrecking crew, right. Yeah. But, but in 1980, mm-hmm. when you, so you started rapping It was strictly New York shit. It was New York it shit. It was New York shit. That's it. Yeah. So what made you you know, this kid living in Oakland say, hey, I'm going to be a rapper like these New York guys? Uh, I was always in band class. I, I was a drummer in a band, marching and marching band. I was fucking um, listening to some songs one day. And I also was a music lover. Ever since I was a kid, I would buy records out the record store, take them back to the house, listen to them over and over again. 
memorize them. I was a big parliament parliament funkadelic fan yeah. where I analyzed every musical note, every word on the album cover, everything that happened in a parliament funkadelic Bootsy Collins world. I knew everything. And when I heard rap, I listened to it as a drummer, you know, naturally being a drummer, and I listened to it as a music lover. And I said to myself, it was 1980, I probably had only heard, probably hadn't heard 20 rap records in, in total. And I said, I can do that. <laughs> and, and most of rap records came with an instrumental. So they gave you the fucking white, not necessarily a white canvas, but they gave you the platform to practice on the instrumental. All disco records had an instrumental. Most rap records in 1980 were fucking renditions of disco records. Yeah. You know? Like Rapper's Delight and everything. So, I mean, I'm knowing this shit because I study music. So, I went and found some instrumentals. It wasn't even, the instrumentals I found weren't even from rap records. They were from, like, fucking some disco era shit that, you know, had the 12-inch the version. You flip it over, and it's the fucking uh, instrumental on the B-side. So, I did it, and I was just fucking around. I just rapped, and it just, you know. The first time I rapped in 1980, I don't think I wrote another rap for, like, about six months. And I played that one rap so much because people kept asking me to play it. And then even if you didn't ask me, I still played it anyway. So <laughs> finally, somebody finally got the nerve up and said, man, we're tired of hearing your fucking song. Make a new song. <laughs> and I was like, damn, I'm making a new song. Like, I, it, it, it just was that moment where the person who told me they was tired of hearing my one song, I was like, I'm going to make a new song. And that was it. I, I went and picked a new instrumental and I had a technique on how I could record it. And then I... At that point, that was like 1981, Christmas of 1981, I had spent the year really messing around with my little rigged up way to record, you know, the little just push play record, those old things. And you sit the radio in front of the speaker and you kind of like crouch down a little bit and just rap into the, the speaker, <laughs> into the microphone, all, you know, just, it only, play, it only sound good when you played it back on that same radio. But I, that Christmas 81, I talked to my mother and uh, getting me a, some equipment from Radio Shack. All I wanted was a mixer, a little voice effects machine, and a, um, a microphone. So you record this, your second rap song. Mm -hmm. Now, were these like the dirty raps, or was it more like some New York shit? No, I was, I was really just mimicking all I had heard. It was kind of, it wasn't a New York style, but it was, the subject matter was basically, hey, check me out, I just walked in the room, I'm kind of cool. You know, look what I'm wearing. It was that, you know, that, that's all I'd heard. Yeah. And it was, I, you know, rap was supposed to be like some, you know, some bragging, you know, you know, put myself up over everybody else type of shit. So I, um, I didn't really get my moment until I heard the message. When I heard the message, I used to always carry a, a boom box radio with me. And I was walking down the street by myself this particular time, listening to regular FM radio and the song came on and I, I think um, there's probably a lot of hip hop fans from that era that can remember the emotions when you heard certain records like The Message. Oh yeah. And I remember where I was at. And I remember what I thought when that fucking song, when I first heard it. I was, it was the first time that outside of like a book or something, I'm listening to music. This is hip hop, this is the new shit. I've, I've read books that describe streets of New York and gangster shit and all this shit. but. This, this song was, was, as I listened to it, I could picture what he was saying. Yeah, broken glass everywhere. So, People pissing on the I'm stairs like they just Probably don't care. two years out of moving from LA, I'm trying to be this young rapper. It's just a hobby. And I'm, you know, it's clicking. I'm like, fuck, man. I'm walking down the street going, I would be dope as fuck if I just told the story about Oakland. I'm looking at it, I'm hearing this shit, and I'm like, damn. And I'll start, I, from that moment, I ran to the fucking house and wrote a rap about what I saw in Oakland, trying to, you know, trying to do my version of Melly Mel. Of the message. And it was the start of something, you know? It just Okay. Now, were you too short back then, or did you have another name? No, I was too short. I was always okay. too short. And I, I never, um, whatever I wanted my uh, future gangbanging name to be in L.A., I didn't, I didn't bring that to Oakland with me. I was, I was getting ready for it. Like, you, you, you got to get prepared, but I moved to Oakland before, I, uh, before the gangbanging days came. Okay, why the name Too Short? Uh, that was a story too, man. Um, it was, uh, it was when I got to Fremont High, man, in Oakland. They, uh, 
they told me that I, I couldn't be called Todd. They was like, man, we gotta get a name for you, man. You can't be Todd. So they started making jokes. I, my brother was older than me, two grades ahead of me. So he's a senior. I'm, I'm, I'm in tenth grade, and it's his buddies fucking with me. They're like, man, we gotta find a name for you. And they just, you know, they was like, they, you know, I was so short. I was probably like fucking five foot even or some shit. Like I was, I was, I was five two when I got my first driver's license. I don't know how I got to be this tall, but I was short as fucking high school. And I think it was like, it was some dude named Shorty that went to, he was probably in 11th grade. He was a grade before me. He went there the year before. And they got me in the same vicinity as Shorty and realized that Shorty was taller than me. And then they just came up with a joke that I was just fucking short. They're like, man, we can't fucking think of name you. You just fucking short. And then they start going short, short, like just trying to fucking like make, make fun. And I remember um, not liking that shit at all. I was like, that's a fucked up name. Just call me short. Like, that's fucked up. So I saw this movie one day called Penitentiary. And the dude who started the movie, his character's name was, uh, you know, Leon Isaac. His char character's name was um, uh, Too Sweet. Mm. And Too Sweet got all the bitches and whooped everybody's ass in the movie. And when I left the movie, I was like, these motherfuckers calling me short. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna change my shit too short. And I went, I didn't tell anybody that shit. I kept that to myself. I went up to the mall and bought a jacket. And it was like, international player, sir, too short. I said, give me the hat to match. So I got the black hat with the gold letters, with the gold, gold leaf and emblems, whatever the fuck, the wings and shit. Sir, too short. And I just rolled up on the motherfuckers. And I, and I, um, I guess probably like the next rap I wrote, I debuted the whole shit with a new rap, with the new fucking shit, like, sir, too short, just like, that was, that was, uh, that was more closer to like 80, though. I think um, another, another key element to the early days of Too Short was the marker. A Sharpie was mandatory. I was not a graffiti artist. I was, you know, to a graffiti artist, you're like, the taggers are like lowlifes or whatever. He's just a fucking tagger. But we didn't call it that shit on the West Coast. It, it, I don't even fucking think it had a fucking name. It was just, you got a fucking Sharpie, and you keep the Sharpie on you at all times. And if you go somewhere and you don't see your name, you put the motherfucker somewhere where they can see it. That's what I did. And I, I used to remember those years before I ever made a real record, before I saw a studio, I remember, remember those years riding around on the bus, walking around the streets of Oakland, and I just, I am like, you're not going to, I'm wearing the hat all the time. I had, I had the black one, I, I started getting different color hats. I had the white one with the gold letters, and I'm like, you're gonna fucking know me, know me. When you see me, you're gonna know it's me because I'm getting a little rep out here and I'm not gonna let somebody else be too short, you know? And there was some motherfuckers going around getting pussy and shit going, I'm too short. And then the bitch stuck his dick and give him some pussy because, <laughs> you know, the name was bigger than me. Okay. I had to like, you know, I had to like always wear my badge of honor, the hat, the jacket, the something, you know? So, I mean, basically, I, I, I look back on that, man, and that was. That was me selling tapes in the streets of Oakland, me tagging my name everywhere, me always branding myself with the shit. I was just marketing and promoting from day one, not knowing what I was doing, just getting it out there, and it was just, you know. Okay. So you talked about how when you were doing your own version of the message, you started talking about what you saw in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about 1980, 1981, crack was starting to hit. Oakland. Crack didn't really hit till 84. 84. Yeah. This is before crack. This is, this is, the, people were doing a version of crack, they were freebasing. But then back then, freebasing was what the elite did. So it was like a reverse effect. Like, it was the same thing as probably smoking crack, but it was freebasing. People with money did it, celebrities did it, so you would more or less brag about it. And some of our early songs, our early homemade tapes, me and my rap partner Freddie B, we would talk about freebasing. And we would talk, we'd talk about it like it was prestigious, like, shit, man, I'm about to go to the house and, and smoke some coke, man, you know? Like, it was a baller thing. And that was before the crack epidemic and motherfuckers, the long-term effects, but, you know. Okay, so you're now too short, you're creating your own, your own music, and Freddie B comes in the picture and he starts basically making the beats? No, nah, Freddie B was, um, he was born and raised in Oakland. He grew up in the uh, Campbell Village projects down on the west side. He did some time in like a couple of camps, juvenile shit. 
He fucking moved to East Oakland. He fucking, when I met Freddie B, he was supposed to, um, they brought him to me for him to like rap and show everybody he was better than me. Like it was supposed to be a rap battle. Cause a couple of movies that came out, motherfuckers wanted to see a rap battle. And uh, Fred, he knew everybody. This motherfucker knew people. I, in the early days, I don't know anybody that knew more, many, more people than him. Cause he knew niggas from the east side and the west side. So um, Fred came to, this, he, he came to Fremont High probably like uh, halfway through the school year. I think he was like at the continuation school going to Dewey or something. And fucking, um, they transferred him over to Fremont High. So they roll, in, they roll up on me like, man, the homie is here now. He know how to rap. He rap better than you. <laughs> About the lunchtime today, gonna fuck you up. This, this, this is my homie talking this though. Yeah. Like they, you know, they, they trying to just tell you, you ain't the only rapper now. We got somebody gonna get your ass. So I'm like, come on, let's do this shit. Let's do it. So they go get Fred. They get me. We meet out where everybody hangs out at lunchtime on the, out on foot on the foothill strip, and we fucking uh, we supposed to battle, which really was just. Somebody rapped, then somebody else rapped, then somebody else rapped, somebody else rapped, and then everybody was going, oh, oh, he was the best, he was the best. While they were doing all that shit, we was like, oh, man, you kind of cool, man, you something, something, you know? And he, Fred was like, you should come by my house and let's, 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 let's make some music. So I dipped over to his crib one day, and he had like, um, he had like those stereos where it's all in one, the record player, the cassette player, the recorder, the fucking microphone plug in, the speakers is all one unit. And he had one of those ones where if you plug the microphone in, you got a choice to go left or right. It's going to cancel out the music on one side. So you record, you got the record, it's an instrumental on the record. You stick the mic in, you're recording your voice and the music. But the music comes out on one speaker and the voice comes out on the other speaker. And I was like, when I was probably sixth grade, my father gave me a stereo system that you could record your own shit and he showed me how to set the levels, don't go too far in the red, and he showed me how to break it down and hook it back up and hook up the speakers and left, right, positive and all that negative and shit. And I used to take pride in my little stereo, just I, I knew it so well that I, you know, wake up Saturday morning, I just take it loose, move it across the room, rehook it up, just because just I knew how to do it and, and just mess around with speakers and shit. And I, you know, I, I took pride in like putting a record on, recording, my, my shit was separate components so like if you, the cassette player broke or something, you could go replace it with a new one or something. But I took pride in knowing how to record. So I had already, when I met Fred, I had already got that mixer and the microphone and the effects machine for Christmas. And I was like, checked out his little setup. I was like, man, you should come to my house <laughs> and, see, and check this shit out. So I got him over to my house and showed him how when you record with my shit and play it back, it sounds just as good as the fucking record with some little special effects on your voice and shit. We made some music. He was like, man, we could sell this. And I was like, sell it. Like, I was like, you know, like, sell it to who? <laughs> he was like, man, come on. We had one cassette tape dipped over to a Royal Park. And at a Royal Park at that particular time, it was probably a half, you know, dozen guys outside, maybe more selling weed, selling whatever. And Fred walked up. Now, mind you, everywhere we went, because of his West Oakland upbringing, his now dwelling in East Oakland, his visits he had to make to the youth authority camps, he knew everybody. Like it was, the, I think all these little factors, all these little things factor in. Mm. He knew everybody. And he fucking, um, he walked up, you know, somebody, you know, his, his real name is Anthony Adams. So people that, I, I could always tell that somebody that knew him from like, really, really knew him, they would call him names like, like Anthony Ant or like A.A., hey, hey, Anthony Adams. So he walked up, somebody like, hey, hey, what's up? And uh, he was like, man, um, we got this tape, man. We wanna see if y'all wanna buy it. My friend's like, buy a tape for what was, like we rapping on there, man. Why the fuck we wanna buy your fucking rap tape? Like, man, we just listen to it. So somebody got a stereo, a car with a loud stereo. They pop in the cassette tape. It's like some dudes leaning on the car, they listening, it's bumping. And, you know, we using, the instrumentals we using, our, our music they probably heard or something. You know, it's, it's, it's just the other side of a rap record. So they listening. And then one of the homies, uh, he hit eject, popped the tape out and said, how much you want for it? And Fred was like, five dollars. 
bam, five dollars, and walked away. And then motherfuckers is like, well, shit, man, I want one. It's like, we ain't got, we only had that one. We're going to come back tomorrow. So we came back uh, the next day. Probably had, you know, I went, and I went and found some shit at Radio Shack. Radio Shack was my spot. Radio Shack, you could buy um, three 30-minute cassettes, a three-pack, for $1.99. So we did the math. If you go buy a three-pack for $1.99 and we go sell them for $5 a piece, every $2 makes you 15 That was the hustle. Mm. That's how it started. Right, so when you said, uh, hit the Royal Park, we got tapes for sale. Exactly. You're talking about that. Exactly. So we, um, we go back to a Royal Park with a bag of tapes. They was like, man, that's just shit y'all had yesterday. Yeah, yeah, let me get one, let me get one. And then, um, so we're standing there going, damn, that worked pretty good. Well, what should we do now? I'm like, well, shit, let's go over to 84th. They sell weed over there, too. So we go over to 84th. It was a trip, man. I, I shit you not. We were like a fucking paper route or some shit. Only, the, we only single file from dope turf to dope turf. We like, they got money, they got cash in their pockets. We ain't fucking with nobody else along the way. Just go from dope turf to dope turf. And we get to 84th where they sell all the weed. And before we can even get there and get our little pitch out, they're like, oh yeah, we heard about y'all niggas. Y'all niggas got the rat tape. Let me hear one. Let me. They, already, they had already, somebody already walked over there ahead of us the day before or earlier and said, man, them little niggas coming with the tapes. So um, we boldly walked up in walking distance just weaving through the city everywhere we knew where they sold dope. Every time we walked up, somebody knew Freddie B from somewhere, had a little small conversation. Somebody, somebody else knew about the music and we fucking, uh, we just started selling tapes. So um, that was pretty much uh, how the ball got rolling. And then things would just happen, like a couple of things happened that were real key to me. One was, one of the homies came and got us. His name was Freddie Pratt. R.I.P. Freddie Pratt. And he, um, he had even better equipment than I had. Freddie Pratt was a drug dealer who um, had some change. He had a car, nice car and shit. Like, he was like, man, can we all come fuck with me, man? Come by my spot. So he takes us to a spot that's, um, that belongs to an OG named Hot Lips. And Hot Lips is like, you know, he's known for, like, knocking motherfuckers out. That's what he's known for, knocking motherfuckers out, box better than everybody, punch you one time, you sleep. So I know of Hot Lips' reputation. I'm seriously like, you know, like, like Larry. Like, you know, we, we in Hot Lips' spot. And I'm like, like, man. And Hot Lips the kind of motherfucker that see you. And he would see us with Freddie Pratt and wouldn't say shit to us. Like that, and, and probably at the same time he ain't saying shit, he got like a look on his face, you know, the mean mug. I'm like, fuck, man. You know, like this motherfucker, if Hot Lips snap, like you, it's nothing you can do. We I mean, knock the <laughs> fuck out. So. Never said shit. We went over there a few times. And one day, um, one day we tried to give him a tape for free. Just, you know, hey man, you know, just, just kind of kissing up to him or something. And he was like, man, I don't listen to that rap shit. I don't know fucking rap shit. He's like, I don't want to listen to some rap shit. If that shit had my motherfucking name in it, she ain't talking about me. I don't want fucking no rap shit. So that shit had us like shook. Like, like hot lips, we just pissed him off. And we fucking, um, as soon as we leave out there, probably Fred. Fred always had all the good ideas. Fred was like, uh, fuck that, man. Let's go wait. Let's just go make a rap record with his name in it. <laughs> you know? And so we go to the house and we make a rap about Hot Lips. Probably name some of his homies. We named the block, you know, the spot, the shit, you know, the car he drive. And without saying nothing, we hand him the tape one day. Without saying nothing, he never ever said liked it, didn't like it, never said shit. Just handing the tape. So that was that. One day we were about, Hot Lips is like 92nd and Sunny Side, 96th Sunny Side, right in that area. One day we were on 89th, a few blocks over, 89th Avenue, just walking around, doing what we do, just me and Freddie B. And this motherfucker, um, Dwight Elders, another, another homie, RIP come rolling up, he, he, he called himself King D. So he rolls up on us really fucking loud, hard, hands, yelling, like, like you, you the motherfuckers with that rap shit? He's like, yeah, my name is King D. There's nothing nice about it, like he's hostile. 
He's like, you, you on my motherfucking block right now. And uh, he's like, man, I need you niggas to make me one of the motherfucking tapes like y'all made Hot Lips. Like, not asking. Like, I need a motherfucking tape. <laughs> like, I want my motherfucking tape. Like, fuck, like, like, it was a threat. Like, if I don't get a fucking tape, I'm after you motherfuckers. Like, you got a problem. I'm named King D. Ask about me. I run this block right here. So, next day, King D got a, a special request. <laughs> and fucking, um, when we handed him the tape, he just like, no questions asked, nothing, just bam, gave us a $20 bill. So then we walk away, here go Fred with the ideals again. Fred was like, well, shit, man, we can start doing this for everybody and just charge 20. And mm. we call it the special request. So now we're selling tapes and we start in the pitch. My job was, I'm the technical guy who makes sure the levels is cool, record the shit, you know. I, I knew how to do the pause mix too, where you could pause it in the middle of a song and then stop, because you might have fucked up or something. And then you put the record back and you unpause it. On the playback, you would never know I stopped it. I had the fucking touch where it just, the pause mix. So, um, um, we would, um, we figured out, you know, I had my, I had my little pen and pad. I used to, I used to take notes at this point because the, the $5 taste was like really moving and we had, we had a little, like a little paper out. So I would take down what block we were on, who was it, you know what I'm saying, that won the tapes and they would order, they'd be asking for a specific little, man, I want that one where y'all said such and such. So I have a little, little, little notepad and then we started adding to the pitch that, Hey, well, you know, for 20, these cost five dollars, but you know, for 20, if you like a baller, like you, like you know, like a boss motherfucker, for 20, we'll make you a tape about you. That 20 dollars is like, you know, 1982. Motherfuckers is, ain't really like just coming up off 20s on like some old rap shit. You really had to have some pocket change. So, not a lot, a lot of, not a lot of lower level motherfuckers was coming up off the 20. It was really a boss situation. So one day. One of the guys, uh, I, I used to go to school with, um, with Lil D, with, with his right hand man, Black, Tim Blewett, and they were from the 69th Village. And they turned me on to one of their, their older homies, uh, his name was Yogi. And Yogi really liked me and Freddie B. He was like the big homie who, you know, he'd come pick us up and hang out with us and shit. He wanted a special request tape. He fucking, uh, you know, Yogi was the kind of motherfucker that got a lot of respect around the city, like a lot. Like, he just rode around and he was like one of them motherfuckers, like, I guess he had to rep for it. If you fuck with him, you're gonna get fucked up. So, Yogi decided one day to ride us around to, to you know, like just particular areas in Oakland. He was like, he was our promoter for a day. He rode us to all these turfs and he was like, we get out the car. He was like, hey, what's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? Yeah, this something too short and Freddie B. I don't know, you know. Y'all heard about him, whatever, but uh, these are my homies. And if y'all ever see them come around here, don't fuck with them. If y'all fuck with them, you fucking with me. So when they come around, support the shit. Too short, Freddie B. And he took us to a whole bunch of neighborhoods. I feel like that was another, you know, thing that just like, okay, damn, well, he fucked with Yo. Uh, you know, got a little, little, little ghetto pass. Like, I, I wasn't, Freddie B was from West Oakland. We mostly doing this shit all through the East. I from, come from L.A. I don't really know none of these motherfuckers. I'm just meeting all of them. I didn't, I didn't go to elementary school, middle school with them, or did juvenile time with them. So it's all brand new to me. And Oakland ain't the kind of city that you can just brand new, just show up and be like, turf to turf. Hey, what's up, man? Doing those special requests for all those guys who were the leader of their crew, who ran their own block or ran the whole neighborhood, it kind of turned us into like mascots of the city. And we were like the soundtrack of the city. Like we were like really like in demand as far as um, we we DJ house parties. I had the whole DJ set up. We would go out and, and Fred knew how to DJ. I knew how to DJ. We we take turns DJing the rowdiest motherfucking house party. Like the party that you probably couldn't even find a fucking DJ to, to do it. And we we were those guys. Hundred bucks or some shit. Like it was a hundred dollars. We fucking DJ your party. The kind of parties where a motherfuckers fight break out. And when the fight is over, we're like, what the fuck is the speaker at, man? The motherfucker just stole the speaker. Why, <laughs> why are you fighting this shit? That's some bullshit. But yeah, man, um, I think uh, the Kingpin connection added to that security of being able to move around the city and, and just 
open arms. Like people just you walk up to the to the to a, the turf, man. Like motherfuckers got rules. Motherfuckers like the shit is like, you know, you one of us or you not. And we walk in LA, short and friend, friend, short, what's up? You know, like it was that type of shit. So Right. And you were the only rappers in Oakland. There was nothing going on outside of us as far as hip hop. When we started that hustle and we were doing that, we were the rappers. There yeah. was nobody else. People probably were in the house getting ready to, to appear or something. You know, the, I mean, you talk to guys like E-40. I mean, motherfuckers was trying to get a hold of a Freddie B Too Short tape. That was something that, man, I got one. <laughs> Copy that shit for me or something. I gotta have that. Yeah. For real. At what point did the 75 Girls deal come together? 75 Girls was uh, 1985. And so you're five years into the game now. And we, we got out of high school in 84. Fred might have been class of 83, 84. We're somewhere in there. And um, Fred went to the pen. Probably selling some dope or something. something. I don't know what the charge was. I, I, don't give me the line. But Fred went to the pen. And while he was in prison, I met a guy named Lionel B on the bus. And Lionel B approached me on the bus and asked me if I wanted to do a show. If I wanted to be the opening act for a UTFO when they had a song called uh, Roxanne, Roxanne. Right. So he, that show was coming to Oakland. He wanted to know that I want to open a show. So uh, long story short, B booked me for the show. I almost didn't book me for the show because uh, somehow we got our phone numbers crossed up and, or lost or something and we we by 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 a, by a chance just by chance we we reconnected right before the show oh i know what he told me beat this is what b told me he said he said he booked me for the show i agreed to do it but we never got each other's information and he put me on the flyer and i he said i found a way to find him and get in touch with him one day say hey man like he could, he was like fuck man i want to put this motherfucking show on the show but i can't find him and I saw the flyer and found him. It's like, hey man, you got me on the flyer. What's up? <laughs> like, put me on the show. So he put me on the show, man. And fucking, um, I went up there, and I didn't have any records out. I did. I never been on the radio. All I had was the the, the street tapes. I knew what uh some of the you know popular songs that I did in the streets that people liked. I planned out this little thing where I got like one of the instrumentals was Houdini. Another one was uh. Shit, I don't fucking know. It was like, I did like three quick little things and made it on the little cassette, same way I do my little pause mix. And when I got out there, it was probably a crowd of like, roughly like about 5,000 Oakland Auditorium, which was later than Henry J. Kaiser. However many that motherfucker hold, it's five, 6,000, I don't know. So it sold out, U UTFO, Roxanne, Roxanne. And I come out there and my shit starts, and from the second I start to the second I finish, everybody in the crowd sang every word of everything I was doing. So I'm up there thinking to myself, what the fuck is this? And everybody backstage is like, who the fuck is that? Like, how is he doing that shit? And one of my homies uh, who I've been hanging around with, Jerry Hodges, he came to me and said, um, he was like, man, you know, my brother got a record label. He was talking about his brother, Dean Hodges. Dean was uh, selling a whole lot of dope and, you know, had a, he had a love for music and had all this fucking fancy ass equipment and was booking out studio time with all these fancy studios and, and working with like all these R&B artists and all this shit. And, and Jerry brought me to Dean and shit, eventually Dean, you know, he, he, he took to me right away, but he, he, he got me in that studio and he put me in the studio with like some real, professional musicians and motherfuckers that knew how to make records. And I was already like, you know, that musical background of being in the band class and, you know, hitting drum patterns and shit. And now you put a drum machine in my hand and give me fucking studio time. And I'm just like, shit, I, I, all my life I've been playing, playing around on the piano, playing around blowing, you know, fucking trumpets and horns and shit, just, just, just from being around the band. Like I'm watching these OGs, these are musicians, guitar players, keyboard players, singers and shit, motherfuckers that done made albums and shit, and I'm watching them. And I'm like, everything is like a sponge. I'm just like peeping the game. I was teaching them motherfuckers some shit though because they kept trying to put me in this rule book 
of how to make a record. And I'm like, at, you know, I got in the studio in 1985. So we had already heard Beastie Boys, Run DMC. They had already took that fucking 808 and turned the motherfucking down there, boom, boom. The bass was, it, it was unleashed. So when I get in the studio, I'm like, dude, the bass is that shit. Like somebody, it's like a young cat in the studio right now trying to tell me that, um, put the auto tune on me. And I'm sitting there going, nah, man, just do it. He's like, bro, I need that auto tune, bro. I need that shit. I'm like, man, that's not how you do it. He's like, nah, I need that shit, man. So I was telling him that about the 808. Like, I need that fucking 808. Like, I gotta have it. I went and got the homie uh, Chris Wayne from uh, Hunters Point, San Francisco. He had an 808. Like, that's like, I mean, that's like the holy grail. Right. <laughs> this motherfucker had an 808 drum machine. We sat in there, you listen to Born to Mac, the album. Listen to a lot of that early shit, man. We fucking had an 808. <laughs> okay, so you put together an album on 75 Girls Records. Mm -hmm. Now, is all the, the sex explicit stuff is that going at this point? What happens is in 1985, I get in the studio and Dean Hodges and everybody that was around said, you can't curse on records. Everybody knew about the dirty raps from the streets. And like, you can't curse on records. They just, you, they just no record store will sell it. It's like, you'd be, you'd be in the comedy section. That's the only place where they have cursing <laughs> records is in the comedy section. That's what they're telling me. So um, I made this album, it's called uh, Don't Stop Rapping. And I'm talking as much shit as you could talk without cursing. Go back and listen to it. It's just, there's no cursing. But I, I made songs like Playboy Short, and I'm talking about being a pimp and being a player, but I'm just not cursing. And then I did another one called Players. And it was they had me on the same, same regimen, like, you, you know, talk shit, but don't curse. So I'm walking that fine line of what is it to talk shit without curse words. It's kind of cool concept, too. And then um, in the meantime, I'm making these, what I know how to do best, which is flip a, a record over and, and just do my version of somebody else's instrumental. And I'm just doing that constantly. Dean had all the best shit at his house. And I'm just like, you know, using that shit, man, whatever the fuck. I'm, I'm, I had made these, a bunch of, I, this, this is what I did. I made an imaginary album. Like they had me in the box with the clean version, clean, clean lyrics. So, I made an imaginary album. I took all these like fucking like, I don't know if it was seven, eight songs or something. And I made all these songs. It was the bitch suck dick and blow job Betty, the, the early first version. It was, uh, I, don't, I can't remember all the titles, but it was an album called uh, Raw Uncut Next Rated. And I didn't make that album for 75 Girls Records. That was a cassette tape that he found after I, you know, our, the whole shit fell apart and we moved on. He found a cassette. And he fucking named that shit Raw Uncut X-Rated and put that shit out. And, which is a good thing for me because it's a classic. It's one of the most classic underground two short joints ever. But if you got a hold of that, if you know anything about that, you listen to certain songs. Literally, in the middle of the song with me rapping, the fucking record skips. And I'm like, oh, at one point I'm like rapping and the record goes off and I'm like, Something, something, I'm so fucking high, I rap so much, I just start the record over. I'm in the room by myself, I lift the needle up, start it over, and just start rap. I, just, I didn't give a fuck. It was like, I didn't think it was gonna be an album that came out. So he got a hold of my little imaginary cassette album, put the shit out, and I was with 75 Girls from 1985 and 1986. I had been in the studio listening to these guys tell me how to record music. And I was a great student, but I felt like hip hop was doing some different shit. Now we, we're in 1987 now. Now you got fucking Eric B and Rakim, and you got fucking Public Enemy, and you got, you know, the shit is like, Easy e is about to come with Boys in the Hood. I mean, the bass is like going from like, just being in your life to being all about your life. Like that 808 to this day, it's like, it's damn, it's damn near like a religion to this hip hop music. So I go in the studio and I'm like, I don't even want to make a record. Like, I don't want to make wax. I don't want to do shit. We're going to make some motherfucking cassettes. Everybody bumping cassettes. We're about to make cassettes only. And I'm going to go in this motherfucker and make a song with the most motherfucking bass in the world. Like the hardest fucking song. I had already had the music 
done for playing around in the room. Freaky Tales music. I already knew the drum pattern I was going to do. Got in the studio. Did a real big studio. Did the little woot wop. Freaky Tales is about eight tracks with the vocals included. At the most, it might be seven tracks. It's not a lot of shit. We sat up in there and one take Jake. I did the song, like I, I used to, um, I used to uh, get in the studio and I felt like if I fucked up a lyric or a line, then I'm gonna start, I'm gonna stop and start all the way over again. So I had this whole thing about the one take Jake, just like I'm just gonna do the whole song in one take, fuck it. So if I fuck up and it's an okay fuck up, I'm gonna leave it in there. If it's a major fuck up, we're gonna start all over again. Mm. And I did that whole Born and Mac album like that, like fuck it, let's just go. And fucking um, Freaky Tales. I was, I remember being in the studio and they're telling me uh, it was going against everything that I had learned on how to make records, setting the levels and what you do. And I just, I just remember taking that bass line and that kick drum. And I'm arguing with the motherfucking engineer about telling me that if you keep pushing the bass up louder, when you press up the wax, the, the needle's not gonna stay in the groove. And I'm like, we're not pressing up wax. We're doing fucking cassettes. Turn the fucking bass up. And I'm, my mission was, literally, I wanted to make you blow your fucking speakers out in your car. I wanted to fucking, the kick, the punch of the kick drum to blow your fucking woofers out. The battle against me against your woofers. Okay. And the content, was all sex lyrics, pimping lyrics. It was no one was doing that. Yeah, it, it hadn't been heard of, and because Two Live Crew wasn't out yet, was it? They were they were about to have the same moment as me. It was right. it was the same time, uh, and you would think that somewhere a guy like Luke, a guy like Too Short, you know the the mentality that we have somewhere, this shit was brewing. You know what I'm saying? One we didn't have to get it from each other, but it was it was in the air. Easy E didn't get. Boys in the hood talking shit like that. It wasn't inspired by Too Short. He just it was it was that time it was about to happen. Right. Motherfuckers was talking shit, and I had the angle because I had been in Oakland and I had been closely exposed to this real pimp and hoe game and just the lingo of it, the visuals of it, the reality of it, and I was studying it and I was you know incorporating it in the music. And when I came out, no matter who was cursing in the later 80s and really like you know talking about how it is from where they're from they wasn't putting that pimp shit in it and then if you said in a record I'm just I'm I'm I'm, I'm a pimp he wasn't really talking about that Oakland pimping because I was sitting there saying no the hoe is actually going to get the money from a trick and bring it right back and I'm gonna spend the money on me and ball out I'm a pimp that was a big difference and then I don't think people really caught on to the way I the way I stay really true to the pimp game because I'm sitting here hanging around these older pimps and these motherfuckers. I'm hearing this shit and I'm seeing it and I'm knowing it and I'm like really writing what pimps would say and do and really the real pimping, like real. And I'm telling real fucking stories that I'm hearing. Like I'm 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 putting a little two on the ten, telling the story, kind of creative and shit. And it's like. I don't think anybody caught on to that shit for a long. Nobody was really like, when I when I think about rappers that just like really put the pimp in there, you start when like MJG and Eight Ball started like the persona and shit. Like you know, you know certain guys start coming along pimp C and then they're like I'm a pimp. They talk some like bitch, but you know talk about the bitch giving the money and shit. But it wasn't a really popular thing for a while. I had that lane solo for a while, long <laughs> right. time. So you put together Born to Mac, and you put out independently or through through a label initially. Independent. Independently. Mm -hmm. And it sold fifty thousand independently. About sixty before we signed up, up with Jive Records. So sixty thousand cassettes. Cassettes only. <laughs> cassettes only. Mm -hmm. You were, I mean, I guess what? Because this had to be more than just Oakland, right? Was it? Yeah, we were uh, doing it through City Hall Distribution, so uh, they were... Oh, they were around back then. Okay. Yeah, they were doing uh, mostly NorCal and then anywhere they did ship out, outward too, but it was, it was concentrated on NorCal. We, were, we, were, we, okay. could, we, couldn't keep, we couldn't press them up fast enough. We probably could have sold a lot more than that. Okay, so you were making a lot of money as a, 
I mean, you were at that point, what, like uh, 18, 19 years old, 20 years old? probably about 20, yeah. Okay. So you make so much noise with this independent release Mm -hmm. that Jive came around. Mm -hmm. Who did Jive have on their label at the time? Uh, They had just signed KRS-One. They had just signed The Fresh Prince. And Houdini was a big star, a big act, and Kumo D was huge. Right. Fresh Prince went on to win a Grammy, I think the first rap Grammy. Yeah, but that was, we, we all were the next class. It was before us, it was, uh, it was, remember Jive had a rapper named Jazzy Jeff that wasn't a DJ. Yeah. Okay. Jazzy Jeff was on there. He had some records out. It was, it was a few people on there. Okay. They, so, was, so they, they, they are had like Billy were... Ocean, <laughs> right. Samantha, Samantha Fox and shit. Okay. Right. So th- they were an established they weren't huge like they are now, but, you know. Jive pretty much was, uh, you know how like a label has a parent label? RCA Records was their parent label. Right. I think at first Arista was for a little minute, and then they went over to RCA. Yeah. When I got there and I did my second album with Jive, the first album I recorded for them was Life is Too Short. Yeah. As soon as I went to go on a promo tour, it was not Jive Records. It was RCA Records. Okay. So they take Born to Mac, mm-hmm. which... To me, is my favorite tune. Kind of remastered it a little bit, yeah. made it a little cleaner. Okay, but essentially added, added a song. Okay, so it was essentially the same mm-hmm. album that you'd already put out, mm-hmm. right? And that had my favorite two short songs on. That's when I think I was introduced. I think I was introduced. I think I was introduced to it right before Life Is Too Short came out. Because I remember I went to the store and bought Life mm-hmm. Is Too Short, but I'd already had Born to Mac. Yeah. So when Jive re-released Born to Mac, Life Is Too Short probably came out six months later. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense because one of my classmates played mm. me this and I'm like who the fuck is this oh this is a kid from Oakland like oh shit like there was I think right around that time there was like a ill-mannered ill-mannered posse cassette was kind of mm-hmm. floating around with, with Cougnut and stuff mm-hmm. like that but there really was not really Oakland hip hop Oakland rappers but you know Born to Mac was I thought was incredible Dope Fiend Beat is my favorite two short song ever. Oh. <laughs> just, just the vibe of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a one time thing, man. It just <laughs> happened. And we, we even tried to recreate that vibe. We could never do it. It's just something that happened that day. The settings in the studio. The, yeah. I don't know. So then Life is Too Short comes out. And that's, that had like the single on it. The Life mm-hmm. is Too Short. The, the actual song mm-hmm. was. The first video I did. Yeah. And it was on Yo! MTV Raps. Yeah. For, we just turned the cameras on. First time people probably got to see Oakland in, in the. In the world, it was, you know. Yeah. And you were, I remember you were coming off of a grave, like like a tombstone. Mm-hmm. We went, life is too short. We Right. It was like Sucker MC, born on stage, died on wax or oh, something yeah. like that. Okay. So, number one, how well how well did, did Born to Mac do on Jive? Uh, born to Mac, after Jive picked it up, they sold about another 200000 by going nationwide with it. And... Eventually, I, th- I remember last checking, it was at like, like 900 something thousand. I think it finally got certified platinum. Okay. So then Life is Too Short came out, but that was like the more of the, I guess, the commercial album that had the single and everything else like that. Life is Too Short came out, and we did um, 300,000 sales in three weeks. Nice. And that was the video I dropped, the single was getting radio, radio spins, and to a label, Back then, they would put a lot of work in to get a gold album out of an R&B artist. They put a lot of work in to get three, four hundred thousand sales and consider it a success with an artist. And now you got a rapper that you haven't even started promoting, and you get three hundred thousand sales in three weeks. They were like, "Get this motherfucker on the plane and get him here right now." <laughs> and they they put my ass to work, and that's you know that's when I was starting you know really really realizing how the game worked and and you know what my part was and and how to be fucking huge because I was. I really do appreciate that timing because Jive still had the parent label RCA. RCA were, you know, record people. They had, I'm, I'm getting in the hands of people who like been breaking and pushing records for 20 years and shit. And they like, you know, youngster, here go the game, blah, blah, this and that, and, and telling me shit. And it just, those are those lessons that are invaluable, you know? If I had come along when Jive was fully independent, I don't think they ever had that status of, of those kind of quality people that were at RCA at the time. 
you know, later on, Jive became a big label through like Britney and all that shit. But yeah. the young Jive had growing pains. I was, I was a part of that, but I was not really affected by young Jive's growing pains because every, everything we did was platinum back then. But I could have missed a lot of lessons that I learned for the couple of years that I got to roll around with the RCA team. Okay, and then a year later, Short Dogs in the House came out. So you, you were just dropping album after album, because like Border Mac, 87, Life is Too Short, 89. Short Dogs in the House, 90. Like so you were just back to back to back. Yeah, I figured that it was so easy to make records and that I have been making so many songs in the streets before I ever got a deal that I had a fucking box. Not a shoe box, a fucking box, like a, U, a U-Haul box full of raps. And I was like, the only people I ever heard these raps was the Bay Area. So I'm going to actually recycle every rhyme in this fucking box. <laughs> and then I, I, um, I remember Life is Too Short went gold. And then we went on tour with uh, NWA on the Straight Outta Compton tour and came off tour and I had sold... Um, 800 something thousand records. I got off tour and they said, too sure I got shot in the head in the, in the crack house. <laughs> and I sold another 500,000 records. And the fucking check came. And I was like, I just did the same shit I've been doing in my bedroom all these years. And they gonna send me a check for this amount? I was like, man, fuck this shit. Like, I would make a record. I would make an album, turn it in before they send me the budget. They're supposed to send you the budget to make the album, right? I would make the album and send it to them. And then they would, that would, means they have to send me the whole, the, the front end and the back end, just all in one. I wouldn't hit it with no recording costs, nothing, just like, bam, just here. Here's the album, send me the budget. You know, watch how the singles did what they did, watch the videos get in play. And the second I felt like it was over, then I'd send them another album. I'd already <laughs> recorded it. So each album got like about a nine month lifespan, you know, a year at the most. Yeah. I'm like, here's another one. And they, I remember when I, I wouldn't even go to New York a lot. Like they didn't even really know me in the early days. It was just like, oh, too short to come for a visit or, you know, or we saw him on the West Coast. I don't know. It, it was, it was not a lot of, I was a very fucking low maintenance artist. I'm sure that Barry Wise will say that. He's never had an artist before, during, or after that was as low maintenance as me, as far as you give him the album, the shit goes platinum, you don't have to do shit. When, it, when the shit got to the point where I was putting out some shit and I'm like, man, I need, I need you guys to push this record. Barry Wise said some shit to me one day. He was like, man, we're just really not in the business of promoting two short records, man, because we, we never had to. <laughs> I was like, fuck you, man. <laughs> fuck this shit. Yeah, they they um they never had to. Just just okay. shit out of me. I remember Short Dogs in the House had a Ice Cube song on it. Mm -hmm. And that was because the relationship from going on tour with NWA. And mm -hmm. Ice Cube had already left, I think, NWA at that point. Ice Cube was um, you know, a very important member of NWA on the Straight Outta Compton album. Yeah. He had his own segment of the show where Dre and Ren would come out and be the first thing you see, and then Ice Cube would come out and do like 20 minutes down there by himself, because he had solo songs and, and shit within the group. Like he had a lot of songs and you know, Gangsta Gangsta and all them shits, and Dope Man and shit, and fucking, um, and then Easy would come out. And I don't know, for some reason, man, on that, on that Straight Outta Compton tour, I just really got cool with like Layla, who was, uh, you know, the, the force behind Above the Law. Yeah. And I really got cool with Ice Cube. And Ice Cube was leaving NWA, or getting ready to sh the truck shake us sometime. Ice Cube was thinking about leaving NWA or, or contemplating or whatever the fuck. It was, he was about to leave the group. And, you know, he was, uh, you know, looking at cats like me and just, you know, just like, what you think? And I'm like, Shit, man, if you ain't getting your money, I'm like, we just came off tour. I'm pulling up to your house in a brand new Mercedes. I'm a solo artist. When when I get my money, it don't go to somebody else, and then they pay me. I'm like, you do the math, man. <laughs> Shit, like, like you oh, know. Okay, so so you influenced Ice Cube to leave the group in a way. 
I'm pretty sure that Ice Cube made up his own damn mind. I'm pretty sure that Ice Cube talked to quite a few folks that said yay or nay. But when it came my way, I, my analogy was, you know, my money comes straight to me. You see what I'm driving? <laughs> we just got off tour. All the money that I made on tour went to my pocket. Right. Like, you know, shit, I'm just, I was like, man, you, you sitting there saying, because he told me that, um, that they bought, like, Corvettes and new houses or some shit. They went and, I think it was Dre, Dre, Easy, and Yella got a chunk of money that Cube didn't get. I don't, the way the movie told it, it was because Cube wouldn't sign the, the contract or something. Right. But I don't think at that time Cube or Ren got the chunk that everybody else got. Okay. So he was tripping on that. I didn't, I didn't really see that in the movie, that, that they all had fancy. It might have been there. Was that in there? I don't, I don't know, but he was tripping on that, and he was tripping on uh, you know, just just he wanted to be in control, man. He wanted to be his own boss. Okay. He knew he was a boss. And by Shorty the Pimp, were you already like a millionaire by that point? I was just making a lot, a lot of money back then, man. I never really see it as because I wasn't like wasting my. I was like business smart as far as like the money. The, we had a rich company, and the company was like really fucking rich at all times. We didn't, we didn't do shit like fuck off all the money and and like you know I, I I literally drew a salary for my own company a fat salary but I I just took out a certain amount every month and then if I needed if I saw a car I like I would be like uh let's all get bonuses <laughs> right the company would buy the car yeah some shit like that but um when Ice Cube left NWA we, we went on tour the next year together so if he left NWA in after the tour in 89, in 1990, the next summer, he had, his album had already came out and we were on tour together. America's Most Wanted. Yeah, we went on Great, tour for one that. One of the greatest hip hop albums ever. So now, and those were two of the best years of my life as far as touring and just enjoying life and you know, just going on the road with NWA, next year going on the road with Ice Cube. That's just, it's like childhood memories. Yeah. So you kept dropping albums. Uh, you know, you dropped Shorty the Pimp in 92. You drop Get In Where You Fit In in 93, Cocktails in 95. These were all albums that I, I was buying myself and, mm -hmm. and bumping. Um, at one point, though, you decided to leave Oakland and go to Atlanta. Well, the Oakland thing is, um, it just has to do with the, the streets that I ran through and the people that I hung out with and the shit that was going on with them at the time. And... Uh, I mean, point blank period, everybody knows the story. The fucking town split up in two. And not the entire town, but a whole bunch of people. And the numbers in the hundreds fucking all were cool with each other. And then all of a sudden, fucking weren't cool. And it was, a, it was kill or be killed in a small ass town. And the numbers don't lie. In 1992, 1993, the homicide rate in Oakland was higher than it's ever been before or after. And we know Oakland has been violent. We know some shit about Oakland. And I talked to my young homies and they're like, no, it couldn't, and he's like, man, it couldn't have been violent in such and such year. And I'm like, check the fucking numbers. So when I huh. show them, 92 and 93, it was a lot of fucking killing. It was a lot of fucking shooting. And it was everybody that I knew personally, like my homies doing it to each other. And I just, I went to the freak Nick and had the time of my life. The Freak Nick was always my birthday weekend. In Atlanta. I, in Atlanta, Georgia. I had the time of my motherfucking life. And I came back, to, came back home to Oakland. I, I went to Freak Nick for a weekend, stayed for two weeks. Came back to Oakland and I was like, I fucking love Atlanta. And mind you, for one year of my life, when I was in like piece of the seventh grade to piece of the eighth grade, my mother moved to Atlanta. And I went to school out there and everything. I stayed in Atlanta for like one year. And I always had, I always knew Atlanta, lived in College Park, Old National Highway. So when I got back in 93 and, and saw the Freak Nick shit, I just kept thinking like, you know, my homie had showed me, um, my homie uh, Tony O asked me, uh, he was like, I don't know how it came up. I was like, I'm about to buy a house in Oakland Hills. I'm about to give me a house down a private road, you know, something fly. He was like, Shit, how much you gonna spend? It's like shit, probably I don't know, five, six hundred thousand, I don't know. And he was like, Let me show you what you get in Atlanta for five hundred thousand. 
And they was showing me how I was like, you fucking kidding me. And then it's the freak neck. I'm looking at these big ass houses that cost 350000 Right. Big I, ass I, yard. I went to your house in, Oak, in, uh, in Atlanta that one yeah. time. Yeah, I, a nice house. <laughs> so I get back to Oakland and it's like murder, death, kill. Murder, murder. You gotta like ride around at all times with a pistol. You gotta fucking really like watch who you fuck with. Really like uh, can't let motherfuckers know where you live and shit. Can't, you know, it's just everything started getting real. Like the rules changed because it's a small town and you got, you know, dozens of motherfucking killers on the prowl looking to kill somebody. And motherfuckers, my homies told me, it was like, man, you still hanging around so and so and them, huh? Like, yeah, you know, bullets don't have no names, short, huh? I'm like, okay, so. What was it over exactly? Uh, you could say a lot of shit. I, if you want my version, you got to ask around. Ask, ask around, because I hear different stories. Uh, my version was uh, there was some, some, some kind of uh, lower level money guys at a dice game at a park one day, and it was some upper level money guys in the same dice game. And in uh, all dice games, you know, at some point in time, somebody's going to fight or argue, and the fight broke out. And the my version is that the the cat who didn't have the most money kind of quick, quick, bing, 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 and kind of wanted to fight a little bit. And then that shit escalated to some shit talking and some shit that spilled over to some other shit. And eventually, somebody got knocked the fuck down. Somebody got killed. When somebody got killed, it jumped off a war. But I also feel like that just wasn't behind a dice game and a fucking little friction that happened at a dice game. It was, to me, it was more about the younger motherfuckers or the uh, one set of motherfuckers was like, we run these streets. We really on the pavement. We really in these motherfucking streets. We tell dope, we do all this shit. We kill motherfuckers. We in the streets, on the pavement. The other motherfuckers was like, well, motherfucker, we own these streets. We kind of like, you know, sell the most dope and got the most money and we do it like a real different kind of way where we kind of move like mafioso kings and shit, you know, and it just clashed. So you got the motherfuckers who feed on the pavement roaming around looking for these other motherfuckers. You got these other motherfuckers who got all this money who could probably just hire somebody or just, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was a crazy little war, but casualties on both sides. I don't give a fuck who tell you who won who did the most, who did the, sh the shit, that shit, uh, I didn't want no parts of it. Because I wasn't selling dope, and I wasn't a motherfucking killer, and I wasn't protecting my turf. I wasn't, you know what I'm saying? I'm sitting there looking at these motherfucking strippers and these motherfucking bitches in these Daisy Dukes and just everybody dancing, having a good time going, you know what, I got all this money, man. I think I'm going to go live out in this party for a little while. And... I went to this convention called Jack the Rapper. It was probably like, you know, four months after Freak Nick. Got to Jack the Rapper, didn't tell nobody shit, didn't say nothing. I, um, I jumped in the car, went and rode around some of the neighborhoods my homie had showed me, creeped up to the little sales house, the little office where they sell the, sell the houses, and bought a house. <laughs> I bought a house, I gave him three Gs, to hold my lot and we we'll gonna get all the paperwork and do all the shit and give me my, the plans. I, this the house I want built and shit. And I, I about shit. That was that was August of '93. I was living in that house by Christmas. Okay, so you showed up in Atlanta mm -hmm. right at the beginning of the Atlanta hip hop scene. I didn't just show up in Atlanta. I showed up in Atlanta. I actually either convinced or helped or. Whatever the fuck, I brought I brought a whole fucking thing with me, like like dozens of people, like a whole move. I had people moving up from L.A., like my cousins and and folks and shit. Like we about to do the movement, and we showed up. And then we, as soon as we got there, we recruited a gang of motherfucking Bay and L.A. motherfuckers. Like you know, oh, that's my folks, my folks, that's the folks, okay. And we instantly, like day one, we just showed up with like, oh, that's too short now. Like we were there. Yeah. It wasn't no, there was no outcast. Yeah. It hadn't happened yet. 
I mean, Criss Cross probably had one album. Yeah, Jermaine Dupri was out there. It was so, TLC so TLC had an album out. It was yeah. probably like Tony Braxton and Tony yeah, Rich. Yeah, L.A. Reid was out there. Yeah, LaFace was, was, the, yep. was the only game in town. So Jermaine and Dallas Austin were kind of like, you know, extensions of LaFace. And, you know, when I got there, they were grooming artists like Outkast was about to happen. Um, Monica was about to happen. She was like fucking 12, 13 years old, just a little youngster in the studio. And a lot of shit that we know and love wasn't even in existence yet. It wasn't even being groomed or anything yet. So I showed up in Atlanta as Atlanta was really like the, the foundation had been laid. It hadn't really been built up to be. You know, it, MC Shadi was huge. Fucking, uh, what's my boy in there? Whoop, there it is, tag team. Tag team, yeah. It was, you know, but then those, those were like more like a you know booty shaker kind of uh, Miami sounding records, but Too Short showed up. I showed up when I showed up. I was um, I'd already had like Born and Mac was gold. It was Life is Short Dogs in the House and probably Shorty the Pimp. And then oh yeah, and then I'm getting where you fit in. Mm -hmm. So I showed up to Atlanta right before I did cocktails. I made cocktails at Dallas Austin studio in Atlanta, at Darp Studios. Now you're, you're in Atlanta and you're doing your thing and I kind of felt like Too Short was, wasn't at his height anymore. And then when you hooked up with Lil John, things did a 180. Well, we made two platinum mountains in Atlanta. We made cocktails. Shot the cocktails video. You see the trees in the background with the drop yeah. top. That's Atlanta. All them, all them bitches. That's my house in Atlanta. That was, uh, and then I did Get In Where You Fit In. I, yeah. I did um, Getting It. Getting It was made in Atlanta. I mean, that. Oh, okay. I feel like that, Getting It is where, when I said I retired, and then we came back. When I came back after Getting It, what you probably didn't know, and what a lot of people probably didn't know, is... And Banks moved back to the Bay. He stayed in Atlanta for a few years, and it was like he, he moved back and got married and wanted to be close to his family. And um, I used to make records with Aunt Banks, Pee Wee, and Shorty B. And we made, uh, me, Aunt Banks, and Shorty B pulled off, um, we did the Shorty the Pimp album. And then after that, when it became Getting Where You Fit In, Getting Where You Fit In, Cocktails, it was four albums. Uh, yeah. Fucking uh, Getting In, and one of them, I can't think of. All those albums were just me, Pee Wee, Shorty B, and Ant Banks. Pee Wee was a member of Digital Underground. He wasn't like always in the forefront, but he was in damn near all the videos. So at some point, he played keyboards with Shock G. And we made all those albums, and we had a sound. It was a sound that, when you look back, it's, the, it's a lot of people's favorite songs in that little, that little cluster right there. Mm -hmm. And when I came back off of that retirement, I was kind of like starting to mix and mingle with different producers and different like beat styles. And we did uh, the You Nasty album. We did the Can't Stay Away album, which Shorty B stayed with me, kept that flavor. But I think I was always like, you know, I needed Ann Banks to, to maintain that thing. I needed Ann Banks there 24-7. And I started using my man Taj Tillman, who was a damn good engineer, who saved the day during those years and kept shit real quality. But I still needed Ant Banks, you know what I mean? And Banks would always throw me some beats and some shit, but all those times I had Ant Banks from beginning to end, he had a certain touch that when I work with a person like Ant Banks, it's like working with like an Android version of me or some shit, like I got a robot that does what I do, that knows what I need to do, but it's gonna do it better than me. And he knew that shit, I knew that shit. I was too short, I had the fucking audience, I had the fucking swag on the records, I had the fucking ink pen to say the shit, you know what I'm saying? And Banks knew how to fucking make that shit perfect. And, you know, I think from there, that bridge between Banks to Lil John was a few albums where I even, I made an album one time and my cousin was like, Man, the one thing I listened to you for ain't even on this album. He's like, <laughs> where's the bass? I was like, what? I went back and listened. I was like, damn, I wouldn't fucking made an album and the bass ain't even 
Like, I, like we live by the base. Yeah. That was that fucking, um, one of fucking, what's my favorite word? No, it's Chase the Cat album. The bass is not too short bass. It's just not. Right, that was 2001, Chase the Cat. Yeah, so, um, Little John had been around since about uh, probably like 97-ish. I don't know. I don't know what year we made him. Couldn't be a better player. But I could have had a lot of more things, a lot of more stuff in the works with Little John, a lot, a, a bigger catalog, if Jive Records didn't intervene. Jive Records was, uh, I would always like find some good shit and be like, man, y'all want to take a look at it? And Little John, I was going, you know, I, I turned him on. I was like, check, check the homie out. Like, he got that shit. Like, I was like, that's the guy. And they told me, oh yeah, we know about Little John. He's, he's hot, but it's, he's pretty much um, that Northeast, like uh, that Southeast. He's never going to leave that region. Mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's, a, that's a local sound that's never going to, they were talking about that, like, crunk that bounce, because, like, that's never going to leave that area. I was like, all right. And then um, Little John was signed to TVT Records. He got a deal with TVT. He, um, he almost got caught up in a situation where he couldn't do shit. He was signed to some indie label that wouldn't let him out the contract. And I came in, got little John out of his contract. What didn't take much, was no miracle. Just was like some money and some, you know, just like, come on, that's my folks, whatever. It was all, it wasn't shit. And I tried to get him to jive. Jive didn't want to fuck with him. So he got to deal with TVT. And TVT asked Jive, how much can we pay you to do, to use Too Short for eight songs on a project that Lil John's doing? They said, uh, we'll give you a dollar a record. So no matter what TVT and Lil John agreed to give me, they was going to give Jive a dollar record just to borrow me for eight songs. And Jive turned it down. And I was just like, you know, I was like, what the fuck is that about? Like, this, this, this is about to be some big shit. And it went on to be a big project, too. I don't know which one it was, but it was a, a compilation Lil John did that had hits on it. And I was supposed to be on there. I probably was on it, but I, was on, I wasn't on eight fucking songs. And next thing I know, Jive is paying Little John top dollar, the same motherfucker who they told me don't, don't bring him around, to produce Usher and Petey Pablo and all these other motherfuckers. They was, they, he was their go-to guy. Got some E-40 songs. Like, he was giving them hits. And I go back and go, I thought you guys didn't like this dude. <laughs> They're like, oh, no, no. As a producer, I was like, oh, trying to double talk or, or he got better or something. I'm like, man, fuck y'all. Like, it was, a, it was, with them, it was more like business as usual. Like, short sure is right. This guy's hot. But we don't want to fuck with him too short. So they go back all the way around the motherfucking world for six month, 12 month swindle and go back and start doing big business with the homie, which well, I've never been that guy who was like, you know, trying to go like fucking start a war or some shit behind some bullshit like that. But at the same time, I was like, my guy, you gonna stop me from working with my guy, and then you gonna work with him. So that was that was like the the part where me and Jai, we just we just the friendship was like over with for probably like the last two three albums. It was like a wrap. Okay, but you had dropped like what, what, how many albums with him? Like seven or eight. One, two, three, four. Yeah, we, five, we lost six, the love seven, like around um eight. Can't stay away was Jive? Yeah. We lost the love. You nasty like, was Jive? Yeah. Chase all the of, Cat? All the way up until ten, fucking, ten albums? It was more than that, it was like twelve of them other Twelve albums. You nasty, Chase the Cat. Might have uh, been more than fucking. What's that, my man? favorite word? Married to the game. Okay, so you a So lot. after a while they just stopped doing anything. Like they, they not even to the point where, you know, couldn't even get a two-week promo run out. You couldn't get shit. Like they, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't even promote Blow the Whistle. They put right. that shit out and like, nah, it's all right. Which Blow the Whistle ended up being your one of your biggest songs ever. Probably it Probably surpassed the, everything. Yeah, biggest song ever. Yeah, with, with incredible beat. The label Barry Wise apologized, but at the time <laughs> they they said, um, oh, we don't have any budget to promote that. It's you know, it's a West Coast record. Like they always say, man, Jive did not get it, man. Most labels don't get it though. Right. And then Jay Z ended Jive. up jumping on it, did a freestyle on it, and it get, got new wings. It just, it just, it just, 
it just kept going. It go, it's still, I hear the motherfucker every time I go to the club. Yeah. I hear the motherfucker when I'm walking in the club is playing. And I'm like, I know they don't know I'm here because I'm just walking in. Yeah. So shit, it's cool. It's a, it's a blessing. You and Tupac worked on a couple of songs. Mm -hmm. You had one song on the Cocktails album, mm -hmm. and then there was another song on the um, on Ann Banks album. Mm -hmm. How close were you and Tupac? Tupac was my homie who, when I saw him, it was like, stop, pop, what's up, what's happening, what's going on, smoke one, have a drink. Uh, if you notice, Pac came to hang out with us at the video, me and E-40 video, we're doing the, the rapper's ball. Mm -hmm. Pac came out, just, you know, pulled up and kicked it and shit, and, you know, did, did some scenes and shit. And then um, uh, Tupac was from the Digital Underground clique. My guy, Shorty B, made a lot of songs with Digital Underground, my guitar player. Right. Pee Wee, who was in Digital Underground, made a lot of songs with me. Okay. So at the time, Overlap, you know, yeah. Shock G, I know Shock from before Digital Underground. I, Shock used to work at the music store. He sold me a keyboard one day. <laughs> and fucking, uh, was it Music Unlimited or some shit on E14? Like, 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 it wasn't that, you know, too far a separation. So Pac would come around, like, in the Oakland days, whenever Pac would come around, it wasn't about music. It'd be like he hanging out with Shorty B and Pee Wee. I bump into him, or they come by the spot and just like, what up? Hey, what's up? So they, niggas, them niggas used to smoke blunts. And that shit was hilarious to me because we talking like fucking 92, 91, 92, 93. Niggas, Nobody was smoking blunts. They're smoking blunts. And it's like, I'm like, dude, you niggas take cigars and you pour the tobacco out. And then you roll the weed in the cigar paper. I was like, the fuck out of here, man. Who the fuck, who the fuck does that? And you leave little piles of brown shit all over the place, and the fucking shit smells like shit. I'm like, <laughs> like, you tripping, man. And I would have bet all my money in 1992 that blunts would never catch on. Because <laughs> I was, I even, I even got songs where I'm like laughing at the song, like, you niggas smoke blunts. <laughs> so, you know, that was, that was what they did. They came around, they smoked blunts. So, you know, I'm smoking a big fat joint. I, I just, I, I was older than them, man. So I like, I wasn't older than Shorty B, but I was, I was older than Pac and them. It was like the little homies, man. You yeah. know, Richie Rich was my young homie. Right, and he was close Pac to Pac. was Rich little homie. Yeah. So Pac would come around. We, we hang out, we hung out. I mean, I remember hanging out with him and shit. Like just, just me and Pac and Shorty B just hanging out. He just was the little homie. I didn't think, think he, I didn't know he was going to be Legendary Tupac. I didn't know the story. I just knew he was a dope ass rapper. Yeah, I mean, no one back then knew when he dropped his first album. And you know, even back then, man, you got, I'm pretty sure it's got to be the same way now. You put me in a room full of rappers, I'm not fucking telling no rapper, like, oh, man, you fucking dope. Man. You, 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 like, I'm like, <laughs> like, shit, you riding with Short Dog, nigga, what? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's that thing. So, uh, and then I moved to Atlanta. Uh, I would see Pac in Atlanta. I saw him more in Atlanta than anywhere. But then I, you know, if I pull up on um, like remember Death Row was popping, it was it was Snoop and it was Pop, so them my homies. I pull up, I'm like, where's Snoop? Where's Pop? You know, I'm trying to get up in the party. Like you know, they like, oh man, short. So you know, it was always like a, you know, a quick like, what's up? You know, we, I'm I'm on, I'm on I'm on the bitches, man. So you know, somebody like Tupac, somebody like Snoop, man, we can't hang out with each other for too long without without like, man, let me go get on these bitches. How did you hook up with Biggie? Big hit me up one day unknowingly at an outcast picnic. He um, called me over to the car. I was walking through the grass. I don't know if I was leaving, coming, going somewhere, but somebody in a limousine said, hey, yo, yo. I, I walk over to the limo, look in the limo, and the motherfucker just, all he said was, um, hey, yo, you got love in Brooklyn. I was like, for sure, because I don't really get no love in New York. So I was like, <laughs> for sure. And um, one day after Biggie blew the fuck up, he, he, I met him on a, on a tour bus. We jumped on a bus and we was like blowing or something. I don't know, just chopping it up. And he told me that story. He said, one day you walked up to the limo and I said, you got love in Brooklyn. He was like, that was me. And I was like, no shit, like damn. Like, you know, now he was Biggie. He back, when, he when he said it that day, he wasn't famous Biggie. He probably already had his deal or already was like in, in the works, but it hadn't blown up yet. So I'm like, damn, okay. And we kind of like just made homies that day. We get a call from Puff. 
Puff Daddy direct line. No questions asked. Everything is like a hey, big one show the song, man. Need you come to Daddy's house, New York. Whatever the Rangers is, whatever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Make it happen real fast, you know? And, you know, he hooked it up and shit. Bounced up to Daddy's house. And it's like a, it's like a, kind of like a party vibe that night. Bunch of people in the studio, everybody in a good fucking mood, everybody's talking. The song has, it has Puffy's verse already on it and Carl Thomas's hook already on it. The world is filled with pimps and hoes. And then um, we just hanging out. So we got the vibe. Puff is asking Big and everybody, how y'all like my verse? Back then, Puff hadn't had a lot of verses. He had had some verses, but not a lot. And he was still, if you listen to him on that song, he kind of like finding his way as a, as a rapper. He was, I remember some songs he did before that he wasn't really like all the way yet. And he was just, you know, he, he was he was he was proud of his flow that day. He was like, "How you like my flow?" Like, and it was like, "Oh shit, oh shit!" Like, it was it was it was a party, man. And fucking um, fucking um, Big was not writing anything down on a pen or paper, and I was um, just in the mix of the room, just laughing and smoking and drinking and shit. And then Big said, um, he said, all right, I'm ready. And now, you know, I'm just, I'm just watching. I don't, I don't know what the fuck that means. Like, <laughs> like, you know, at that point in time, you, you have a, uh, a pen in the paper and you write your rap. You go in there and say it. Tupac did it. Everybody did it. We did it. He didn't do that. So he goes in there and he, um, he says the first line, when the rim is in the system, ain't no telling what I'm fucking about. That's a, that's a, I'll be young, I'll be like, hold on, hold on, take me back, take me back. He's like, I'll start it over. And next time, he just yanked it, one take, and just fucking murdered them. You know, like when somebody go in the booth and come out in the whole room, it's just like, <laughs> it was one of those. So now I got, the hook is on the song, Puff Daddy's verse is recorded before we got there, Biggie just went in and just made everybody in the room go, ooh, and now I got to fucking do a verse. <laughs> that's all that's left on the song is my little blank 16. I'm like, fuck. And then I, the homie was there. I hadn't even started writing my rap because I didn't, he hadn't, what, it was like, when the fuck did you write that? So the homie was like, man, he said, listen to the song. I was like, damn, I'm going to say after this nigga said that. What the fuck am I going to say? He said, listen to the song. He's like, they not, the hook says, the world is filled with pimps and hoes. We're just talking about those I know. He said, they not really talking about pimps or hoes. He said, just do what the hook said. So I listened to the song. I was like, they really not talking about pimps and hoes. So I was like, let me do Oakland. Whenever I'm getting stuck in my songwriting process, all I have to do is think Oakland, and the shit just starts flowing. So. I told a story about the pimps and hoes that I know. Just to like a little story. I talk a little shit on the end. And I think I, you know, I can never say, I, I'll never say I outrapped a, a rapper like Biggie, but I, I, I hung in there that day. And those, those, that's one of those songs that I feel like it's one of those hit, hit records that was never a radio hit, but it still got this timeless feel that whenever you hear it, it still sounds good. I've even heard people who never heard it before in their life because they're too young. They hear it for the first time and go, I like that shit. So it's one of those songs. The yeah. world is filled. Then you worked with Jay-Z. I think Jay fucked with me. And I think a lot of people, I made a, a lot of records with New York artists. And the first ones I fucked with, I did the song with Biggie. And then I did the song with Eric Sermon, that, that Bayou song. And that was a big New York record and a big Atlanta record, huge in Atlanta and New York. So I think that Eric Sermon, who he was, the producer, you know, you know, the Red Man Connection, Eric Sermon was kind of like, you know, one of the forefathers of, of the second wave and well respected all over New York. But then I did a song with, I had a hit record with Eric Sermon. Then I did a record with Biggie. 
And that's when motherfucking New Yorkers start going, uh, hey, let me get you on a song. But I, the first song I did with Jay-Z was... Uh, uh, a week ago? No, it's called Real Niggas. Okay. Hang in with, us, with the song I sing, Real Niggas Do Real Things. And that's... um. That's a song that Jay Z wanted Scarface on, mm. and I don't know what the I don't know what it was why Scarface didn't do it. I can't remember the specifics, but for whatever reason, when his face couldn't do it, I got the call. And I remember the original version. It's a part in the song that Jay Z says my name. And it, the version I got, when I had to lay my verse, he had said Scarface's name. That's how, <laughs> no, that's how serious it was. Yeah. And, um, yeah, Jay, um, I, did, I did that song with him. And then he, uh, then he called me one time out the blue and was like, hey, can you come do a, do a hook for me in the studio? And at, the, at this point, he's like, Jay-Z, he's like blowing the fuck up. And right. I'm like, I don't do hooks, right? You ain't never heard me on the fucking hook unless somebody tried to sample it. But Jay called. I was like, all right. And that song was, uh, it was all uh, good just a week ago. <laughs> and I was like. Right, and that was on volume two. Yeah. The shit I say on that motherfucker is it, he had already had it. He's like, here go the words, say this right here. So it was like, you know, he had it mapped out already. Right. Because yeah. you didn't do any verses on that. It was nope, all just, just, just the hook. For some fucking reason, he wanted my voice to say that part. And you know, I, Jay, I, I fuck with Jay like that, man. When yeah. um when he did the the blow the whistle remix, when he dropped that verse on there, he was doing that to jab at the dude that was talking bad about LeBron. That was I can't remember who it was. I want to say he played for the Wizards or something. I can't remember what he, what he played for, mm -hmm. but he was jabbing at LeBron at the time when Jay Z was kind of courting LeBron to come be a, a on the, group, Nets. the net. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It had, the Nets hadn't happened yet. It was about to happen, and LeBron had the choice to go New York City, yeah. Miami, or Chicago. So, yeah, he, he, he did that verse to fuck with old boy. Right. But it, but it ended up being like some club shit that I don't even think anybody give old boy credit for. I don't even know his name. 